Hi, I've been looking forward to speaking with you. Uh, since my middle name is collaboration, you'll hear me talk about it. Uh, we have the additional collaboration of John and I are going to uh, run through exhibits that I don't have control of here, so we'll be talking a lot between each other. I wanted to show you, um, wanted to show you as much as I could from the Nevada Rail Plan. Um, and uh, because of the number of tools that we developed, uh, it's just good to see them, because you won't see them in any other rail plan in the country. And um, Peter mentioned the financings that we've done in, in uh, 45 states, and I just want to mention one in particular. There's um, a railroad in the middle of Iowa called the Iowa Northern Railway. It runs about 142 miles. And, the short line owner came to me in 2007, finding himself in the middle of the ethanol uh, boom, but with a railroad that needed uh, $20 million in investment. And um, we solved it by placing that railroad for really all the stakeholders in the state, as well as each county that that rail line went through. We sort of shined a light on what it actually meant for so many other aspects of the community and, and its businesses. I'll never forget, I arranged to take his own banker uh, on a tour of the railroad. And uh, they had been doing business since, uh, since Dan was in high school. And uh, at the end of the trip, the local banker, he said, you know, my office was four doors away from this railroad. I had no idea that it stretched in 140, 140 miles in uh, two directions and serves all the towns that our bank also serves. So we were able to bring a total of um, $42 million to his uh, development and the rest was history. There's, um, you know, I, I wanted to find out why is it that this industry that was the reason capital flowed from around the world into North America in the 19th century, why did it need me to come along to start solving its biggest finance challenges. And so I studied the history of railroads and business and, and lending and banks um, and found that over time, there was just this divergence of understanding that left uh, a growing number of short line railroads uh, and yet banks went the other direction in terms of uh, not having local commercial uh, finance ability. And so it's been in bringing them together and then in bringing uh, what the meaning of r local rail development is for various state agencies uh, and bringing them all together around support programs for and support funding. So I, I have done that on behalf of individual clients for my career in railroads three decades now. Um, and then I've observed the fact that rail plans and freight plans are created, but they're not commercially relevant. They're sort of reports and studies utilizing past, past trends, past history, projecting it into the future, generally identifying choke points and saying, well, we need money to, to, to move, you know, to deal with choke points. And um, so I've written a lot about this and in the state of Nevada, uh, one of the personnel in their DOT, read what I'd written and thought we could do something unique in Nevada. So we uh, were contracted to do a state rail plan. For those of you that don't know, the US DOT requires uh, every state DOT to submit a, a rail plan every f now four years, it was five years. Um, unfortunately, the way the contractual uh, agreements work is that as soon as that plan is written, the money's been used up. There's no funding for implementation. And um, we had, in our proposal, said we're only doing this to implement it. This is not just to produce another report. So this is a uh, post plan. Uh, we started enrolling the Nevada Governor's Office of Economic Development because this was really a statewide rail-enabled economic development strategy. 
And I could see that the DOT was not going to be in position to oversee or partner with us in the plan's implementation. So we started going to the, every state has a, has, has a uh, cabinet level economic development authority and explaining to them how this was for the whole state and uh, that we had identified commercial opportunities that would serve not only the populated sections of the state, but the local, all, every county in, in, the, in the state that had railroads at all. Um, this letter is from the Governor Sisolak of Nevada to Governor Newsom, because during the, during the creating of this plan, we identified that Nevada is, in particularly in its rail network, as well as its highway network, it's a through state. That's the case for a lot of states. Um, and that to implement the plan, we would really need to do it as a multi-state endeavor. You can't, you can only do so much on a state's rail network and really what you're dealing with are supply chains. You can only do so much if you're only going to look within the state lines. Uh, in the case of Nevada, our data, deep data analysis, pointed out that 70% of every truck moving in the state, anywhere in the state, on that trip is in the process of driving to or from California. So the state's being used as a new warehouse and distribution hub, only not for Nevada, <laughs> actually for California, because those goods, after they go into the warehouses in, in Nevada, are actually going back into truck and going back to California. So Nevada's proximity to California, and every state is different. That, that's creating quite a problem because the development that's happening in Nevada is almost all truck served. So let me, um, I wanna go over the tools first. So you can see the tools and then we we'll, can talk about the principles that, you know, that gave rise to those tools. So, um, so whereas most rail plans are done with the main lines as the focus and congestion and choke points of the main line, this is a plan and a model for state plans that actually gets to what's the local, what do the existing and potential businesses in a state actually need to improve their rail logistics? the logistics overall, and particularly the rail. So we started by creating a database, which we then mapped, and if you just scroll down, John, we came up with a methodology for identifying every single sidetrack in a, in, in a state, and what business is on the property that that sidetrack connects to. I guess, not working yet, huh? Oh, good. I, I just couldn't see it on mine. Thank you. So this is pages. You can scroll down to, um, we, we identified 550 sidetracks and found that in the state of Nevada, out of 137 large warehouses, mostly built in the last 10 years, only half of one uses rail. All the rest are truck only. So when you think of a rail plan, they're filled with rail data. We thought, is rail data that useful in a rail plan? That's traffic that already is priced well, it's already getting its service agreements, it's already connected. Not a lot you can do with rail data in a rail plan. It's truck data that you need in a rail plan because the focus of a rail plan should be converting as much traffic from truck to rail as makes sense. So you'll see we get to, um, go ahead to the next uh, section. Now same, same tab, just scroll down a little more. Keep going, you can scroll through that quickly. And um, we came up with another methodology for identifying every truckload shipper in a state. It's never been done before. And um, these are all the rail sidings 
throughout the state. Keep going to the next uh, section. There you go. Nevada truckload shippers, and then one more page. And this is the start of the 573 truckload quantity shippers that we identified. Um, and every one of those uh, names on the left is a link to their website. And uh, now we're going to show you that this kind of data still isn't good enough. Remember, this is an action plan, not a report. We wanted to not only assemble data, uh, it's not really for USDOT. They're never going to do anything with any of these rail plans. This is actually for stakeholders in the state to get a hold of what they need to know so that they can do proper local rail development. If you go to the next, uh, next slide, next tab, excuse me, John. Um, so we're, this was not about us and my team as much as, it, as much as it is. Who are the folks in the state that are already active and interested in rail development? Well, you've got your largest landowners in the state, land developers, your economic developers, your counties, your towns. Everybody's interested in rail development, particularly at this point in time. So we uh, gathered 550 stakeholders, communicated with all of them, and formed them into regional teams. Those uh, different colors are the teams that made sense in Nevada. Of course, Texas would look totally different in, in its regionality as a function of its rail network, its demographics, its uh, economic interests. And so we formed eight teams and um, made all of this data available, available to them as well as the knowledge and information that they need to do you know, to think about rail properly. So if you go to the next tab, you'll start to see what this um, combination of identifying side tracks and properties along nearby rail lines, uh, what it actually makes possible. And this is uh, Henderson, which is a town uh, right next to, to uh, Las Vegas. The yellow lines are the rail lines. The only businesses using rail, I guess I'll just, are the black dots. All the other businesses are that close to rail infrastructure and not using rail. Not the red ones, not the blue ones, not the purple ones, only the black dots. If you go to the next tab, we'll show you in northern uh, Nevada. This is uh, in uh, Reno Stead, just north of, uh, well, just Reno. And uh, again, you'll see that the only businesses using rail even though you'll see sidings into other buildings, the only ones using rail are black. And we did this for all of the um, industrial areas of Nevada. Additionally, thanks to the fantastic uh, chief cartographer in NDOT, we took all of this mapping data and all this stakeholder data and shipper data and put it into a 10-layer web map, first of its kind. I think it might be the next tab. So this is a online 10-layer web map where all the data, who's on every team, where every truckload shipper is, where every property along a rail line is, where the rail lines are, where the roads are, um, where the enterprise zones are, the opportunity zones. Uh, while we're here, that large pink uh, that's the famous Gigafactory that Tesla built. You'll notice there's no rail line to it. Even though, now by the way, this is one of the five largest industrial parks in the world, uh, built over the last uh, 10 years. And 4% um, of the freight moving in and out, out of that industrial park moves by rail. Tesla themselves ship 75 tractor trailers every single day of the, of the year. From there to Fremont in uh, Northern California, where they also have rail, it's all going by truck. It's 75 tractor trailers a night, and they're coming back empty. That's 36,000 trucks that are going over the Donner Pass between Nevada and uh, Las Vegas, excuse me, California. And um, we were able, using this, uh, approach of focusing on every shipper, we were able to point out an excellent right-of-way to take the rail the last uh, two miles and get right to their plant. Um, 
So, one other uh, tool that I won't be able to show with this uh, technique we're using here, and that's that, um, actually, it, sorry, go back to uh, the, the tab right before that, that one. This ref relates to the uh, point I made that it's critical to have truck data in a rail plan. This is where uh, just one of the many tables that we put together to shine a light on what's actually happening with uh, truck flows. And, um, you know, this is where we determined that 77% of the total tons are moving by truck. And um, again, every state is different, but many states are pass-through states. Increasingly, the way the rail network works, um, less and less attention on local rail development. Uh, in uh, Nevada, 83% of all the rail traffic comes in one end of the state, goes out the other end of the state. Of all the freight moving in the state, only 4% moves by rail to or from a Nevada business and uh, less than a quarter percent moves by rail to and, and uh, you know, from and to a Nevada business, less than a quarter percent. Um, that's an interesting dynamic given that the number two industry in Nevada is mining. Uh, heavy materials coming in, heavy materials going out, in addition, you know, all types of aggregates, minerals, ore, and um, it's moving by truck. And when you don't have a robust intrastate rail network, in other words, the ability to move goods and material from sources to processing plants and manufacturing plants, it's a lot like what happens in a developing country where the investor builds a rail line to a mine and pulls it out to the port and gets it on a ship as quickly as possible. You don't have a robust then local economy. You don't have what's called economic beneficiation. And uh, many states in the United States are in that same uh, dynamic. If you, so Maine, Mississippi, um, rob you know, just ample forest products, forest reserves, unharvested, one of the main reasons is that they don't have the efficient logistics, rail logistics, that you need to make moving a lot of different commodities feasible. And uh, that's what you have in, in Nevada, where it's interesting because the number one industry, of course, as we know, is entertainment and tourism. It now takes, sometimes on a Sunday night, for tourists to go from Las Vegas to Southern, back to San Pedro Bay, 15 hours instead of the five or six hour drive that it should be. Some of that is the volume of cars, a lot of it is the volume of trucks that we have. And a um, uh, point that I wanted to mention is, uh, you know, with, particularly with the increased talk about short line railroads, there's a, what's what's uh, supposedly a truism about railroads that we've all heard one version or another of, of railroads, rail transportation not being viable at uh, less than 750 miles, sometimes it's 500 miles, sometimes it's 1,000 miles. But if you think about it, there's 600 non-class one railroads in the United States. They average 72 miles each. They're almost all stable, uh, from marginally profitable to highly profitable. So there is nothing inherent about rail transportation that makes it economical or uneconomical at a certain distance. It's a combination of many factors, and uh, there, there are short-line railroads that are four miles long that produce enormous amounts of profits from those four miles. Some of you will know of the Nevada Northern Railway. It's sort of a famous uh, old-time mining-oriented railroad in eastern Nevada that's now it's claimed to fame as being the host of the uh, star, star train, night star train, because it's so dark there. It's very popular to go out in the middle of the desert on the train. 
And, um, but there's a number of potential rail users along this line. And uh, we actually last week in Nevada gathered all the shippers, potential shippers together to find out, would you be interested in pooling your opportunity in being part of a f feasibility analysis for rebuilding the Nevada Northern Railway? Because so much of rail plans and, and rail business narrowly focuses in on one project and then one project, and one project, and that's, that's belies the nature of infrastructure. Infrastructure is to, needs to be thought of to serve whole communities. And in the case of transportation and supply chain infrastructure, it needs to be con conceived to serve whole regions and whole corridors. That's why you can't just focus in on a rail line within a state or one project or one choke point. What matters is where are the goods coming from and going to. So in this case, um, if you scroll down just a little bit to the next page, these are the these are a handful of the potential users that are along this line, and as well as uh, what we did for each of the eight regions, we identified all of the mines that are in that region. Um, there was another, another tab, go back to, yeah, one more back, John, that's the one with all the projects on it. So this was from chapter five, and these chapters uh, are prescribed by USDOT as to what you have to, you know, how many chapters, what you name them, and we endeavored to fill it, so stop there. Um, so this is 43 different private sector rail development opportunities, totaling $580 million. That's not their, that's not their own business expansion. That's just the rail infrastructure that's needed. Now, why do we have 43 projects here? Interestingly, go down to the next slide, next page, excuse me, and you'll see what Union Pacific wanted us to put in the plan. Three, um, by the way, there are no short line railroads in Nevada, much different than Texas, obviously. Mm -hmm. So all the track is owned by Union Pacific with Burlington Northern having service rights in the, in the north. So the, one of the main themes of this type of rail plan, one is that there's ample private sector capital available for rail development. This does not have to be a public sector burden or expense to build out your freight rail infrastructure. By the way, there's a robust passenger rail component of the Nevada State Rail Plan. I'm speaking today about the freight component. Um, so it's generally thought because DOTs, state DOTs, are so used to overseeing public dollars flowing into publicly owned assets, that when it comes to freight rail development, it, they, the same thinking tends to get applied as if we have to fund rail development. But we say, don't fund freight rail development unless it makes sense for someone. And it usually does, which means there's private sector businesses that are going to make money and save money. It's the job of the, the, the it can be the job of the DOT and the state to do the cross-agency, cross-sector, cross-business, cross-county coordination to conceive of a statewide business plan like this. And uh, so we filled this with 43 individual projects that the private sector can fund, the shippers as well as the investment fund that we're now in gear creating with the state's state infrastructure bank. Um, some of you would know that there is so many uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in the hands of the infrastructure investment firms that want nothing more than to see the North American rail industry grow so that they have viable projects to invest in. They tend to be, uh, have to settle for you know, the next toll road or bridge project 
uh, or privatization of a water project, but in, in fact, they would love nothing more than to, to, than to invest in this kind of coherent, statewide, publicly sector supported plan. So um, I think that uh, just showing the tools gave me a chance to say many of the uh, main um, principles that I wanted to highlight. So I'm going to pause and give everybody a chance to ask questions. Yeah. Did Tesla ever go ahead and implement that uh, connection between Nevada and We're Fremont? still, yeah, we're still in discussions with them. Okay. And uh, this plan was uh, completed in January of 2021. Uh, we were contracted, uh, my nonprofit, On Track North America, was contracted with the uh, Nevada Governor's Office of Economic Development in August, and uh, uh, they're now in full gear with us, uh, taking this on as a state commitment. So the, the outreach to Tesla continues. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the result of the meeting that you had with potential Yeah. Uh, last week, uh, we did 1,400 miles in Nevada, 22 meetings, 70 stakeholders, and uh, it was 100% positive across the board. Uh, this was the first time going out in the field with the state economic development staff. We gathered the, the stakeholders there in Robinson Mine that's in Ely. This is the, the, the host town of the Nevada Northern is Ely. And, uh, they committed to sponsoring the feasibility analysis that we're going to now put together to see if it indeed makes sense. Is there enough business? And is there a, an approach to this, you know, creative approach uh, to use, reusing the, the line that before you get to the $100 million investment that it would take to rebuild the whole line? So, yeah, no, they, they committed. They send right now 26 tractor trailers a day right through downtown Ely a small town. So, uh, well, another thing that came out of it, which is one of the principles, when you gather folks together, not in a town hall meeting, not with surveys, but we actually, we, in this case, we were on a rail car at the, at the tourist railroad. Um, and people were showing up because we had invited them that other people didn't know. Turns out, one, that the hay growers in the area are not able to sell their hay now because truck prices have gone up so high that uh, they'd be thrilled to have rail access right there. And then it turns out there's a, a refinery 40 miles away that's receiving all of their inbound feedstock and sending out all of their, their goods by truck and <laughs> could triple their production at this plant if they had rail. So. Yeah, a lot came out of that meeting. Yeah. Um, in Texas, uh, in conjunction with this uh, talk, uh, I've spent the last four days on the road where we're advising three different counties on their rail-enabled economic development. Um, it's just so important that how you think about rail, how you you know, look at a rail line and a siding and a property and have some idea about can you get rail there because just because there's a rail line doesn't mean you can, you can get service. The economic development community increasingly is a very professional, committed group of people. It's not just, uh, anyway, it's gotten very professional and they're very interested in holistic approaches to economic development, not just doing land deals. and. Uh, we have found and we've started a whole practice at our nonprofit advising economic development entities across the country who are already have an idea that rail would really make sense for them. And increasingly there's just so many, so much rail assets that need tender loving care. And uh, the state DOT could step into this role of providing that kind of knowledge because really I mean, that's what it takes. Rail development in particular has to be 
a hands-on, on the ground. It's not just charts and, and uh, uh, spreadsheets done in a CFO's office. It really depends on going out in the field. What's the topography? How, what's the curve you would need on that line to get to that property? What's the service pattern of the, of the nearby railroad? And uh, there's just not enough of that uh, happening around the country, so people default to truck. Other questions? Andrew, did you have a question? I know, so I just thought I'd put him on the spot. <laughs> Carl, you think of one. Um, but tell us about Tell us about the chicken and egg problem. Uh, I, I'm working with a community that has a beautiful tract of land that is on the rail, and the line is out of service. So the investor who wants to locate a plant says, well, we, if you had rail service, we'd locate there, but you don't have rail service and we talk to the operator or the owner of the line, and they say, well, we're not gonna do anything until there's an industry there that'll uh, commit to 3,000 cars a year or something like that. So how do, how do you get around that? What, what is the mechanism to get around the chicken and egg problem? You build enough of a business model that shines a light on how this is actually gonna work. So often with rail, there's enthusiasm, there's vision, but you gotta get it down to, okay, what is it actually gonna cost to deliver cars to that track? What's it gonna cost for the, for the, tr the track? It probably needs some, some care yeah. to, be, uh, to be up and running. Um, so you just, you have to go through a logical approach because nobody can make commitments without it being grounded when it comes to capital, money, <laughs> operations. So, um, it doesn't have to be, you know, a hundred page business plan. It just needs to be enough so that uh, everybody involved can look at that plan and say, okay, I agree, that's how it could work. And well, based on that, yeah, we'll go ahead and do such and such. Or if you do such, some, you know, it, there can be dialogue about it. And before you know it, you have an agreement. Okay. Well, the um, I think that's it. All right. Thank you, Mike. Yeah.